But there's something about Van Gogh's legacy which is much more important than his fathering this or that ism of modern art. Vincent's passionate belief was that people wouldn't just see his pictures, but feel the rush of life in them. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. Right now it is about one o'clock in South Africa, it's sort of the middle of the day. Um, South Africa is on the same time zone as France, so uh, 130 years ago today, right now, um, Van Gogh would have been um, injured, bloodied, bleeding, hemorrhaging, for around about 16 hours. So he, he has actually just passed the halfway mark in his um, sort of fight to stay alive. Um, you might think he doesn't want to stay alive, but uh, we're going to look at the evidence regarding that. I want to just, before I start today's episode, just thank people who've extended their good wishes regarding just some people that I know that are also, um, you know, dealing with things. Um, the news from my friend in hospital, David, he's um, still in hospital, but he's stable. He's sort of just um, got a slight fever at the moment. And we, we're hoping that he's going to be um, allowed to go home and, and sort of, you know, uh, get better there and sort of be, be in quarantine there. But at the moment, it's it's not, it's not, his status hasn't changed. Uh, so anyway, to get started with today's episode, uh, we're going to go right back into uh, Adeline R Ravu's um, statement made um, around about what's it, um, 50, 70 years ago. So it was almost half halfway between Vincent's death and today. That's when she made a statement in the uh, middle 1950s. Okay, so after I've read the statement, I'm going to put up kind of a slideshow of some of the photos I took when I was in Orve last year. Um, in late May last year, it was a really nice trip. Um, I was really, I didn't, I, I don't know if I expected Ove to be more beautiful than Al, but it certainly, I think, was. Al's got its own sort of delicate beauty, ancient, ancient um, edifices, and it's just a totally different setting. Um, whereas Ove is quite quaint. Um, because it's quite close to Paris. It's just got a small country farm village vibe to it. And, and the whole town feels kind of like a garden. And the, the, the river, the tranquil river was, or was, also gives it a sort of a kind of an atmosphere. It reminds me of a Maidenhead. I lived in Maidenhead for a while. And Maidenhead is situated on the Thames. And it also has that you have this lazy river that just sort of slowly flows, you know, and you can go bicycling along it, walk along it, and it just gives a place a sense of, um, it anchors a place to to something and, and something that's natural. So to continue with what Adeline said, um, she said, Just need to go back a little bit, I think. Uh, 
I'm sorry about this delay. Uh, I thought I was actually in the right place. Anyway, she she talks about the menu uh, was that served during the period in restaurants, meat, vegetable, salad, dessert. I actually ate in the review in myself. I was only I was the only person sitting by myself eating. So I think maybe that's how Van Gogh did it as well. He would sit there alone each day, and you know uh, maybe sat with. Hershig, I don't know, but um, probably on his own. And uh, they also served the same kind of food um, when I went that they served then. Uh, it was quite simple, but quite um, tasty. And I remember um, just being surprised that I was actually able to get get a booking. Um, there was a bit of a misunderstanding. Um, I don't think I'm going to talk too much about that, um, but that was quite an interesting experience actually eating dinner at the Revue Inn, um, as Van Gogh did. Um, so she talks about, I do not remember Monsieur Vincent having any food preference. He never refused a dish. He was not a difficult boarder. In other words, he had a healthy appetite. She goes on to say, the question of religion was never raised in our house. Now, this is quite interesting. She goes on to say, we never saw Vincent van Gogh either in church or at the priest's house. I never knew any Protestants in Auvergne. So that's quite an important point to make. Why would he not be in church? Well, Auvergne, I think in that time was kind of a Catholic enclave. And if you know your history quite well, um, there was quite a big schism between, or schism between the Protestants and Catholics in Europe um, in the 19th century, in like the mid um, 19th century, to such an extent this, this um, divide between them was so strong that it led a lot of people to leave Europe in disgust and sort of come to South Africa, for example. Why? And it, it was really a case of why? Why did you leave Europe? Well, I didn't want people telling me what to believe. I didn't want religious politics foisted down my throat. And so that's how strong it was. So yeah, you kind of had a situation where Van Gogh was a Protestant. Bear in mind, not just any Protestant. His father was a Protestant minister. And also, um, that was his job. His father was a minister. And also, Van Gogh, earlier in his life, and we can maybe look into that, he kind of went into the priesthood himself. He, he wanted to follow his, his father's footsteps, but in kind of a different way. And this is important. He wanted to be a kind of people's priest. He kind of wanted to go down into the trenches with people. And he literally did that. He went to the the, the very grim coal mines of the Borinage and sort of taking a leaf out of uh, Emile Zola's book and, and that old Charles Dickens, the grittiness of the poor. He, he wanted to immerse himself in their experience and he wanted to comfort them and soothe them um, sharing this, the same sweat on his brow. He wanted to, does that make sense? And so he, he was a very sincere, intense, passionate, authentic person. And what I also find silly with a lot of these contentions is people seem to think that he didn't know what it was like to suffer. Well, working in a coal mine in the Borinage and sleeping on straw and, and tearing up your sketches to make um, kindling for fire and and smelling. You know, when the priest visited him there, he smelled and then eventually kicked him out. They said, you, you can't represent us. We don't want this. It's not decent. Um, you know, he would invite a pregnant prostitute to stay with him so that he could look after her. So he had a very good heart. He had kind of a soft heart. And so he knew suffering. He knew the suffering of others. And so to say that he was suffering in June and July is a joke. It means you, you've got no idea who this guy is. You've got no idea what he's been through. Something else just 
is quite a tough guy. I think I've spoken about him before. Van Gogh had previously walked from, I think, London to Ramsgate. He'd, he'd made like 50 mile walks when he was a little bit younger, not just once, multiple times. Um, I don't think I've ever run 50 miles. Um, it's, a, it's a long way to go. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a long, you need to be physically very strong to, to be able to do that. And he went walking virtually every day, not necessarily marathon distances, but certainly um, he got his exercise every single day. So let's just go further. She goes on to say, um, okay, so I just want to make the point that Vincent was a Protestant staying in a Catholic enclave. Now, the Catholics are extremely, um, what's the word? They're, they're extremely certain or they're extremely, not rigid, but they, they, they've got a clear idea what they think about suicide. It's, they, you know, the, the Catholics are more concerned about certain things, let's put it that way, than the Protestants, just in a general sense. I think suicide falls into one of those categories of, of things that the Catholics would approve of less. I, I don't, I'm not saying Protestants would approve of it, just that the Catholics would approve it even less. Um, and we're going to need to talk about this just because when Vincent is dead, he's going to need to, there's going to need to be a funeral. He's going to need to have someone pray for him and, and whatever. Who's going to do that, given that he's committed suicide? Are you telling me he wouldn't know that? Bearing in, bear in mind the story is that he's committed suicide to prevent hardship to his family, to spare his family pain, to kind of, as a favor to his brother. That's kind of the story. So you're telling me is as a favor to his brother, he's going to commit suicide in a town that's mostly Catholic and kind of cause a scandal. He's doing this intentionally. And it gets worse than that. I mean, um, at around about this time, I, I kind of need to be absolutely sure, but I think at around about midday, to early afternoon, Theo arrived in in Auvers and went to see be at his brother's bedside. Now, do you also think if Vincent wanted to commit suicide, he would sort of commit suicide and then to to spare his brother pain, to spare his brother stress? So he's going to commit suicide and then and then have him come over and sort of. Um, deal with the stress of watching his brother die over 13 hours. Don't you think if he did botch his own suicide, he would have said, no, please don't call my brother. Call him after I've died, kind of thing. Um, anyway, um, Adeline goes on to say he was not a difficult boarder um, and the question of religion was never raised in our house. We never saw Vincent... Van Gogh, either in church or at the priest's house. Well, we know he painted the church in Auvers, it's a Catholic church. Um, she goes on to say, I never knew any Protestants in Auvers. Vincent did not visit anybody in the village, to the best of my knowledge. So she's wrong about that. We know that he did visit Dr. Gachet, in his own words, several times. She goes on to say, he had few conversations with us. Father, who had been established in Norvez only a few months before the arrival of Vincent, was then 42 years old. So her father was just five years older than Vincent, so they may have been quite familiar with one another, sort of um, been on the same page in a, in a basic sense, just in the sense of being men of the same age. He did not hold a conversation on art and did not discuss with him any material questions. So Vincent didn't really get that friendly with, um, uh, is it good stuff? I can't quite remember his name, but anyway, Adeline's father. Now, my impression is that when Vincent went to Auvers, he, he was sort of 
He was trying to turn a new leaf. He was trying to be on his best behavior. He had a weird experience in all where he befriended the people there and they didn't really like him much and it, it almost seems like they kicked him out of, of all or they were, were part of a, a petition. So I don't know whether he drank with him or what, but whatever he did, I think the revelry went on a bit far. And so here in Orver, things are a little bit different. It's, it's, it's more of a, as I said, it's like a Catholic enclave. It's smaller. It's more close-knit. There's not a brothel in town. And so the suits Vincent, he's going to be kind of well behaved, he's not going to drink, he's not going to womanize, he's going to work, and that's what he's doing. And that is what I think he was doing. He would he would diligently get up in the morning, have a meal, not cause any problems, not cause any arguments, not do anything unnecessary, go out into the fields, paint, come home, write a letter to his brother, and have a meal, and that is what he did. Right, that is all what his focus was on. It was on repairing his life, repairing his reputation, repairing his career, uh, getting back on track. And I think he's quite serious about it. And Adeline seems to reinforce this, although it's not 100% accurate what she's saying, but it is giving us an indication of what she saw. She says, on the other hand, Vincent had attached himself to my little sister, Germaine, and um, at the time, um, his sister, her little sister, Adeline's sister, was actually living with her. So obviously, as older women, um, they sort of they were companions, I guess, in later life. Um, Adeline writes, she was then a baby, uh, two years old, and I think you can see her in the doorway in that one black and white image. You see Adeline and this little child. Um, standing next to her, I think that is her, her sister Germaine. And she says, she was then a baby, two years old. Every evening following the meal, he took her on his knees and drew the Sandman for her on a slate. That's quite interesting. So every evening he would he would actually pick up the the baby, maybe most evenings, and and draw a picture for her and kind of amuse this child, right? And this would not only, I think, soothe the child, but I think it would soothe him. I think it was a little bit like having a puppy. Um, I think it was a distraction from his troubles, and I think he, it was quite a charming little experience. I think it's probably a cute little child and so on. And so you would draw the sandman for her on a slate or horse harness to a cart in which the sandman stood upright, throwing sand by the handful. And if you know your little legends that the sandman is, is like a sort of story that adults tell children, you know, you, you must go to bed because the sandman's coming and he's going to throw sleep in your eyes or whatever. And that's when you wake up the next morning and you've got sleep in your eyes, right? So Vincent was sort of playing with that metaphor literally and in a, in a, in a um, quite a warm um, way. You know, he was being um, almost like a, an uncle, um, you know. Anyway, so she says, um, following this, the little girl kissed everyone and went to bed. Vincent had not spoken to me before he did my portrait other than for some polite words. One day he asked me, would it please you if I did your portrait? So that's quite interesting is he didn't really talk to Adeline. He didn't, he didn't, um, try to make conversation. He didn't engage her. And then one day, out of the blue, he sort of said, would, would it please you if I did your portrait? He didn't say, can I do your portrait? He said, would you be pleased if I did your portrait? And then she said, he appeared to really want to. So she could tell that he was quite ardent. And I think that's right. I think he... 
I think he, if you look at his his portraits, how many portraits does he do of men? He doesn't do none, but he certainly does a lot of women and, and also younger women. And I don't know if artists would be the particular male artists. I don't know how many male artists are particularly interested in drawing other men. I think they are far more interested in drawing other women. From for quite a for a host of reasons, um, it's about beauty, but it's also about the lines and um, and I think the experience as well that that's involved. Um, there are of course some interesting men that he did paint, like the postman and um, the doctor and this one and that one. Not only Doctor Gachet, but also the doctor in in all. So. Uh, um, that is a factor, but I think there's a totally different vibe when it's like that. Um, just, I'm not sure if this is necessary to even tell you, but um, I once actually sat for a um, portrait, not a portrait, but a friend of mine was a really good artist, and I think I needed money uh, while I was at university, extra money. And they said, well, if you sit for these art students, you, you can get so much money per hour. And um, you had to take off your clothes. Um, I managed to not have to take off all my clothes. but um, And at that stage, I was, um, I think, quite vain because <laughs> I was a triathlete. I still am, but not not to the level I was then, but I was one of the top triathletes in the country. And um, although I was earning money, I think I quite liked the idea of um, um, almost having it, I don't know. Um, on the one hand, I, I felt shy and uncomfortable, but on the other hand, there was something exciting about it. Um, I think I did it twice. And I think I actually read a book while everyone was... So like maybe 10 or 12 people in the class and they were, you know, making stretching noises on their pads and so on. And um, and I could just sort of read while they were doing it. And I think it was like an hour, I don't think it was more than an hour. Um, but yeah, I think I was a slightly different person when I was at university. Definitely more extroverted than I am now. Um, but all I'm trying to get at is, is when someone does your portrait, it's quite a interesting experience. It, it can even be quite a sensual experience. Um, I don't think it necessarily was for Adeline, but it may have been for Marguerite. That's kind of my point. So interestingly, through Adeline, we get a sense of what it was like. And also interestingly, she's she's quite disappointed with the portrait. She's like, wow, this is this is what you did. This is is this supposed to be me? And I don't think it's a good portrait myself. I think Vincent van Gogh paints some stunning paintings, like the one behind me, and some terrible paintings, like the one of Adeline Revue. I think it's that's one of his worst, to be honest. I think the figure in Dr. Gachet's garden is also one of the worst figures he's ever painted. That's just my opinion. Um, so anyway, Adeline says that he seemed to really want to paint her portrait. Bear in mind, this was at a time where I think he was hoping to paint Marguerite Gachet's and, and she sort of said, I think he'd, he'd asked if he could, but he'd asked her father. And, and then it took about a month for it to actually happen. And I think a week before it did happen, he painted... Uh, Adeline Revue's portrait. Who knows whether he painted it almost to 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 show Marguerite that it's that he's safe to be with, or that someone else did it. Um, what are you afraid of, kind of thing? I don't know if that that figured into it. In any event, um, he she said I accepted, and he he asked my parents' permission. Bear in mind, it is quite a conservative society, although I don't think, I, I'm not sure if that would be any different than today. I mean, I've, I've photographed um, young women and uh, even 
teenagers and invariably you you they've also got to ask their parents permission not always but typically and so you know that's that's quite normal um and so she did ask her parents permission she says she was then 13 years old but she said she appeared 16 she appeared older she says he did my portrait in an afternoon in one sitting during the sitting vincent did not say a word to me smoked his pipe non-stop so that's going to kind of give you a sense of of him you know he, here he was not um fraternizing certainly not flirting not not really engaging with her he's concentrating on his art he's concentrating on his picture and despite all that it's a pretty terrible execution but one wonders when he painted marguerite who was definitely older and who was um how did mr picture put it she was of legal age or the age of con she was past the age of consent which is a subtle way of saying a certain thing but i wonder whether when he painted her portrait whether whether they said anything to one another bear in mind she's an older she's still young but she's an older woman would would she also say nothing the whole time maybe she she did but whether you're saying something or you're saying nothing you, you you're definitely going to be thinking things you're going to be thinking what is this person seeing how am i presenting myself how do i appear right and a young person thinks about that a lot more than than other people so there's the sense of making yourself vulnerable and then also the sense of the artist um almost entering that space and being allowed to study someone and and um, you know absorb who a person is and i think van gogh really needed that he was, he's a lonely guy and he had a lonely year so i think moments like this he did really enjoy he did uh, quietly um, kind of have fun with it so she goes on to say he found me very well behaved and complimented me for not having moved. I was not tired, but it amused me to see him paint and I was very proud to pose for my portrait. Dressed in blue, I was sitting on a chair, a blue ribbon held, in, held my hair. I had blue eyes, he used blue for the background of the portrait. It was therefore a symphony in blue. Monsieur Vincent also made a copy in a square format that he sent his brother um as he indicates in one of his letters i did not see him do this copy there's also a third portrait of me i don't know this last one so obviously it meant quite something to him if he did three iterations of that portrait of adeline um and why I'm telling you this is um, this is her experience of this person who's now lying upstairs, two flights above the restaurant, dying. Um, it's not someone she just saw once or twice. She she had a couple of um, close encounters with um, personal, you could even say intimate moments with, and now this person who has seemed benign and sweet and kind is now bleeding and suffering and she simply cares about i don't mean she cares about him i just mean that she's she knows this person and as a result is involved she she's there when it happens and so she it's it's a it's an event that she'll remember for the rest of her life and she will be asked about it later and this is the result um she goes on to say i confess that i was only poorly satisfied with my portrait that i was even disappointed i did not see a resemblance and i really like this from uh, adeline it shows she's a she's not a bullshitter she she's just very 
got her feet on the ground. She's just like, well, you know, it was a great honor and I, I, I was amused by it and I, was, I enjoyed it, but I didn't think he did a really good job. I agree. And to have that kind of, um, how can I put it? You know, it, it involves her. It's about her and, and, and she doesn't embellish it. I think that's, that's a sign that we can kind of rely quite well on most of what she says, don't you think? She, okay, so she goes on to say, nevertheless, last year, someone who came to see me to talk about Van Gogh the first time they'd met me, they recognized me from this portrait that Vincent had done and added, this is not the youthful girl that you were, that Vincent saw, but the woman that you would become. Nice words, but sorry, I don't uh, think it makes the portrait any better. Um, she goes on to say, neither of my parents really appreciated this painting. So credit to them that, that they, I mean, credit that they didn't um, think that it was this this masterpiece, although it was certainly worth what masterpieces are, are worth. Um, unfortunately for them, um, she says, at this time, very few people understood the paintings of Van Gogh. That's quite important to um, emphasize in the same way that Protestants were sort of almost like illegal aliens walking around France, um, certain parts of France. Um, you know, expressionist artists were also like oddballs, like, like what is this? And even Gauguin, who was also an expressionist in a way, thought Van Gogh was, was but over the top. Why are you painting so quickly? Why can't you just think about what you're doing? And Van Gogh um, wanted this rush of life, you know, he wanted this rush of life captured in, in energetic and sort of flourishing strokes. And something I want to emphasize, I'm glad I remembered, is in every single episode, I've started with Simon Sharma talking about what is the message in all of Van Gogh's art? Like, what is he trying to convey in this picture behind me? What what is he trying to show in 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 these vivid landscapes? What is he trying to show in the, the, the these clouds, right? And in every single episode, it sort of cuts off where he says. Um, Van Gogh wanted people to experience the rush of life, right? And that is why it's so ironic and sad and disappointing that this artist who was so focused on trying to convey the rush of life, and I think he conveyed it often quite well. This painting certainly conveys it quite well. Wheatfield with, with crows conveys it well. Um, Story Night, which is on the wall on that side, of where I'm sitting conveys it quite well and there, and, and there are quite a few other paintings as well and and so you've got this artist who's trying to convey the rush of life and then he's saddled with he committed suicide he was troubled he was depressed he wasn't happy he was miserable no he wasn't he had difficulties but he also transcended them as he did in the Borinage as he did in Saint-Rami as he was doing here in Auvergne. So that is the thing that he was feeling and that was the thing that he was expressing. So he's expressing the rush of life and everyone's going, oh Van Gogh, yeah, yeah, he was not happy, he was miserable, he, he was experiencing the, the, the weight of life, the, all that. Really, was he? Was he painting a picture every single day because he was feeling miserable? Or was he painting, painting a picture every day because he was feeling this rush of life and writing about it every day and using these vivid colors, these bright, vivid colors, because he was suicidal, because he was depressed? Or oh, the depression hit him like for five minutes on the 27th, really? I'm going to deal with the question which all of this is essentially about tomorrow. Sort of I'm going to deal with it on the chin in terms of um, 
was he murdered or did he commit suicide? And I'm going to deal with it in two ways. Sorry, I'm going to I'm going to look at a article written by a very respected art expert and historian and someone who's written multiple books about Van Gogh. So I'm going to give you his version, his analysis, and I'm going to show you how utterly stupid it is. Well, I think it's stupid. At the end of the day, it's going to be up to you to decide what you think. Um, you don't need to accept what I say and you don't need to accept what anybody else says. You've now been shown a lot of the evidence and you've been shown a lot of the letters and you've gotten to know Van Gogh is. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do, um, probably tomorrow, but it might be the day after, is I want to show you some of the forensic evidence. I want to talk to you about the, the actual trajectory of the bullet through his body. I want to talk to you about issues of time. And I want to talk to you about when his brother came to the house and, and the sort of almost like a detective investigation. Who came to visit him? What time? What was exa what was said exactly? Um, what did Theo say about it? What was said at the funeral? In other words, we want to do an investigative report on like what what did the witnesses say? What did they see? What did Van Gogh say? Right? And and then and then you can really then you'll have the information at your disposal and you can say, okay. I think one of and I'm this is just a little precursor to that, I think one of the most important aspects is is missing, and that's the gun. Where's the gun that he shot himself and where did he get it? And that you might think that that's not a big deal, but, but where have you ever heard in a true crime thing that the, the murder weapon or the suicide weapon, who, who cares where it is? We're not going to look for it. We're not going to care where he got it from or if he didn't get it from where it came from. It's like, it tends to be one of the most important things. So we're going to address that um, either tomorrow or the day after. Let me just uh, see if I can finish this letter. Um, it, it's, well, it really does go on quite a while. So I think I will deal with her letter where she talks about, here is what I know about on his death, right? And we are uh, not quite there yet. I'm just trying to see how much further I've got to go. Okay, so... I'm just going to quickly, I've only got about three minutes before this video cuts out, so I'm just going to go through this before the, the, night, the, the incident itself. She says, I wish to emphasize that I only posed for one portrait. I confess that I was purposely satisfied. I didn't see a resemblance. Um, my parents didn't appreciate it. At this time, very few people understood these paintings. I believe... Um, she says, we kept this picture until 1905, I believe, as well as that representing the town hall of Orver that Vincent had offered to father. So he'd given her two paintings, or given the Ravu family two paintings. One was of Adeline and the other of the town hall. These would have been worth millions later on, multiple millions. Um, and then what happened is, she says, again, I saw Vincent paint this last canvas on our sidewalk in front of the cafe. So the town hall of Orvez is directly across the road from the Ravu Inn. And uh, maybe you, you can see that in photos that I took. Um, she goes on to say, it was the 14th of July, the town hall was decked out and there was a garland of lanterns around the trees. I think 14th of July is Bastille Day. Now, on Bastille Day in Lust for Life, it's depicted as this big festival and and um, Kirk Douglas is out of the whole thing. He's, um, he's not painting the city, the town hall. He's gnashing his teeth and feeling very lonely and scratching the surface of the table and that's how lonely he is. And, and that's, that's how terribly poorly it's depicted in Lust for Life. Okay, she goes on to say, after 15 years, the paint on these canvases started flaking. We were then in 
Moulin. Across from our cafe was the Hotel Pinchon, where some artists were lodging, and there were two Americans, Harry Harrison, who lived in Paris, I believe, and in Moulin, and the other was nicknamed Little Father Sam. There was also a German and a Dutchman. They knew that Father possessed two works by Van Gogh. They asked to see them, and then they insisted that Father give them these canvases because they said the paint is damaged and it's necessary to give them special care. So they kind of under the ruse that, well, there's a couple of flakes missing on these paintings. I think you should give 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 us these paintings. Now, bear in mind it's Americans who want the artworks, not Dutch folk and not French folk. Why? Because the story of Van Gogh at this time uh, around about 15 years later, I think, had emerged in a book which which was Joe's work, which he put the, the, the um, letters into a book, and the book was translated into English, and the, the book kind of took off more overseas than it did in, in Europe, especially in America, and then that book ultimately became Lust for Life, and then based on that book, they made a movie. And so Vincent's fame kind of happened in America, not really in Europe. It sort of circled back to Europe and then the Europeans were like, oh, yeah, uh, yeah he's, he's not a bad artist or whatever. And then they turned his horns into tourist attractions and they've been make, make, trying to make money out of it ever since. In any event, um, let's deal just briefly with a final paragraph before the incident. She says, Van Gogh filled his days in an almost uniform way. He took his breakfast, then at nine he left for the countryside with his easel and his artist's box, always with his pipe in his mouth. He was going to paint, just like my grandfather. My great-grandfather also painted and smoked his pipe constantly, just like a trademark. He returned punctually at noon for lunch. In the afternoon, he often worked on a painting in progress in the painter's room. Sometimes he worked there until dinner. Sometimes he went out for four hours until the evening meal. She doesn't say what time the evening meal was, but he does come for all three meals. After dinner, he played with my little sister, drawing her the Sandman, which she's already said. Then he immediately went up to his bedroom. I never saw him write in the cafe. I think that he wrote in the evening in his bedroom. And what was he writing? Letters. He's like doing his homework. He is focused on his mission. His mission is to make a comeback as an artist. He's serious about it. He's dedicated. He's doing it every day. And he did it the day he was shot, the 27th. Where did he have dinner that night? At the Ravuni for some reason. And that is it. I'm going to play out with a slideshow.